welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the scriptures that have become real to us and try to draw greater lessons and applications and thus power from the scriptures as a result. We surely need it. I'm your host, Kerry Mulstein, and in this episode, I'm tempted to call it a short cast, but it'll probably be a mid to long range cast just because we have a ton of history to cover. So we're going to try and get through it. Uh, Again, these are crucial for understanding so many other things in the Bible. The things we're going to talk about here are you just have to know it. You're not going to be able to read it all if you're just doing the the reading for Come Follow Me. And if you're going to try and read it all, then you're going to have to read a lot. Um, But I'm going to get you the storyline in a pretty quick fashion. So you may remember that as we ended last time, we'd gone a little bit beyond what the sign reading was then because there's all this huge bunch of chapters that we're skipping. And in this week's reading, we go all the way from, I mean, we cover like 200 years in this week's reading. Anyway, um, we we have um, <clears throat> Jehu killing um, uh, Jezebel and uh, and Ahab's line and, and starting a different dynasty. Uh, Hazel of Syria is taking over a lot of territory. And you'll also remember that we had um, a, a marriage between the the northern and the southern kingdoms and you have the daughter of ahab who is the mother her name is athaliah and she's the mother of ahaziah king of judah and ahaziah has just been killed by jehu so when athaliah that that daughter of jezebel and ahab uh and mother of the king of judah judah um hears that he has died she kills all the royal men of judah um, and uh, is trying to kill all of the king's sons. She, one is spirited away. His name is Joash, and he's hidden by his aunt, um, who's married to the, the high priest uh, Jehoiada. And uh, so Joash is hidden for a while, but Athaliah takes wealth and goods from the temples, and she gives it to the house of Baal. So she's her mother's daughter, right? Uh, killing all sorts of people and gaining power and worshiping Baal. And she becomes queen. She rules in Judah. Um, until and and uh, probably would have reigned for a good while if Joash hadn't been hidden by Jehoiada. And uh, then Jehoiada, when uh, uh, Joash is old enough, brings him out publicly in the temple and makes a covenant between the people and the king and God and anoints him king. And he makes this covenant that they'll serve God and keep the covenant. Um, they break down the house of Baal uh, and get rid of Athaliah, and uh, Joash reigns in righteousness. And he and Jehoiada raised some funds and they re- repaired the t- uh, rebuild the temple and do a lot of good stuff together. Uh, so lots of righteousness and lots of good happens. Unfortunately, when this priest Jehoiada dies, uh, Joash turns to wickedness and supports worshiping groves and idolatry, which is just sad. But anyway, and the prophets uh, testify against this wickedness. One day we're going to have to have more talks about idolatry, but um, and uh, including Jehoiada's son, Zechariah, who's now the priest, and Joash kills Zechariah who's his cousin and the son of the guy who took care of him. Uh, but anyway, God, as a result of this, he sells Judah into the hand of her enemies. Uh, Hazel comes and conquers towns in Judah, such as Gath, and he goes up against uh, Jerusalem and he defeats Judah, but his army is, is smaller. So it's just because God is helping us with what we learn. And uh, Joash sends Hazel a gift uh, and uh, Hazel goes back to Syria because he's basically paid off to do it. Um, Joash is left, he's either wounded or diseased, it's hard to tell, and then uh, his own people kill him, and his son Amaziah takes the throne. Um, during this, Jehu, is the, he's the king of Israel, but during this reign, he dies, and his son Jehoahaz reigns after him, and he continues in the idolatrous traditions of uh, Jeroboam, the worship of the calves at uh, the, the Dan and Bethel. Um, and Israel suppressed by Syria, but then the Lord delivers them for a time, and Jehoahaz dies, and his son Jehoash, who's also called Joash, so Jehoash and Joash, same guy, he takes the throne, and he follows the traditions of Jeroboam, um, but they're not actively supporting uh, Baal and, and uh, these other gods, and so there are various phases we'll talk about. The, uh, they're still not righteous for fully righteous because they've got this one form of idolatry but they're not like jezebel and ahab where they're bringing in all sorts of things and really sponsoring it and that kind of thing uh so anyway uh joash visits elisha um as tenderly as elisha nears his death and uh, elisha prophesies that he'll have some success over syria so that's in the northern kingdom now we go back down to the ranch in judah 
Uh, and we've got Amaziah, who has ascended the throne of Judah um, while Joash is reigning in, in Israel. And he follows the Lord. He's a righteous king, and he tries to get, regain Edom as a vassal, and he gathers a large army, um, and he pays money um, for, for Israel to be part of his army. And he's told by prophecy that God doesn't want men from Israel in his army. So despite the fact that he's already paid them, he listens to God, and he sends the Israelite mercenaries home. And he trusts that uh, God can help them despite their small number, and God does help them, and they conquer Edom, or it's Seir, is how it's S E I R, is how it's written in the, the Bible, the same area. Um, and uh, again, uh, they make them uh, Edom a vassal of Judah. Um, and then Amaziah brings home some of these spoils, including their idols, and soon he's worshiping Edomite gods. So you see how easily even good, righteous people who are following God. Um, when you get some kind of idol somewhere around you, how easily we turn to that idolatry. There's a great lesson for us in here. Just these, there, we have to identify the things in our world that are easily turning to idolatry uh, and, and the, in our lives, I should say. There's surely something in all of our lives, and we have to figure out what it is that just keeps turning us to idolatry. In any case, the kingdom of Judah spoiled by those mercenaries that Amaziah had sent home, and he seeks revenge and challenges Israel to a battle, and Joash, king of Israel, tries to dissuade him, but eventually they meet in a battle outside of Beit Shemesh, and Judah loses, and Israel goes on to pillage Jerusalem. So this is what happens when you've turned from following God to idolatry. Uh, it's not too long after this that Joash dies, and Jeroboam, known as Jeroboam II, because there was Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom, he starts to rule in Israel, and he has a very long and prosperous rule. The, the biblical writers who we should remember are working for the court in the kingdom of Judah, so they never like anything from the north, have nothing good to say about them, and they will not say that Jeroboam is righteous, and he doesn't get rid of those two calves, but other than that, he seems like a pretty righteous king. And he has a very long and, and prosperous rule. He reconquers territory um, uh, and, and controls uh, central Syria, even north of Damascus and uh, all the way down to the Dead Sea. Uh, so he gains control of most of Syria and Gilead and the Ammonites and parts of Moab and so on uh, that had once been part of David's empire and been lost. So he, he gets Israel back to the largest size it would be since David's time. Um, it may be that he didn't take territory from Moab. That's a part we, there's some debate about, and we can't really quite tell. But anyway, um, we're not going to focus on that too much. It's uh, during this time period that Amos is prophesying. So this is one of the things is I want us to get the context for each of the prophets. So we'll study Amos in a little while. I just want you to have this context. He, he begins his prophecy around 760 BC. We can actually date it a bit because he mentions an earthquake that we can date. Um, and he prophesied during the reign of two of the longest reigning kings in Israel, Jeroboam II and Judah, Uzziah, who we'll talk about. Uh, so, all right, this is the days of Amos. Jonah's also from around this time period. He's prophesying somewhere in this time window. <clears throat> um, meanwhile, there's a conspiracy in Judah, and a Amaziah is, is killed. He, he flees all the way to Lachish and dies there. And his son, Azariah, is put on the throne. Now, Azariah is also known as Uzziah, two names for the same guy. We keep getting this, right? So when you read about Azariah or Uzziah, that's the same person. And he follows God, and he has a very long and very powerful and prosperous reign. He conquers Philistines, taking Gath and Jabna and Ashdod and places like that. He defeats some Arabians. He receives tribute from the Ammonites and controls territory all the way to Egypt, including down in the Eilat area today. Um, he refortifies Jerusalem, including with some new innovative weapons of war, and he builds fortifications throughout Judah. Uh, he has a long, peaceful, and prosperous reign. Peaceful for them. I mean, they take over other people, but in terms of what's happening inside of Judah, it's peaceful. And it's uh, during this time period that we're going to get Hosea that will begin to prophesy to the northern kingdom, especially as we get to the end of Jeroboam's reign. And, and there, after he's, he's the one northern kingdom prophet that we really have a lot of writings from, and he, uh, he prophesies during this time period. All right, so eventually, Azariah or Uzziah, he attempts to make an offering in the temple, and a priest tells him he doesn't have the authority to do so, and he's smitten with leprosy. Um, it would seem that he builds another palace outside of uh, Jerusalem since he can't be in the city as a leper, and he, he lives and reigns in this other palace. We're not 100% sure of that, but we found a palace that seems to, to fit that bill. Anyway, um, so during his reign, uh, Jeroboam dry, dies, so they overlap these two long uh, kings, uh, for a while, but anyway, Jeroboam eventually dies, and uh, that's Jeroboam, the second king of Israel, and his son Zechariah reigns in his place. 
Um, and he keeps doing the sins of Jeroboam the second, right? These, these two calves. Um, but then he's assassinated by a guy named Shalom. And then within a month, Shalom is killed by a guy named Menachem. You can see how unstable the Northern kingdom is, right? And Menachem reigns for 10 years. Um, and this is when uh, the Assyrian empire is getting really big and they invade Israel during Menachem's reign. And he has to deliver a lot of treasure to take the Blazar the third, who is the king of Assyria in the Bible. They, most of the time they call him Pul, P-U-L. Um, it must have been his nickname or a derogatory name. I'm not sure. But anyway, Pul or Tiglath Pileser the third uh, gains enough uh, control and has enough success in Israel that Menachem has to pay him a ton. Uh, and then Menachem dies and his son Pekatya takes his place. And after two years, Pika and Pika may be a nickname for Pekatya. We may have two guys with the same name here, but we're not going to confuse you further than that. Let's just go with Pekatya and Pika. So after two years of Pekatya reigning, Pika, who's a leader in his army, assassinates Pekatya. Um, and uh, he, he kills, uh, kills him in uh, Samaria with men from Gilead as his accomplices, and he makes himself king, and he reigns for 20 years. Uh, and Pekah rebels against Assyria and withholds the tribute that Pekatya was, was uh, paying them. And so uh, Assyria comes back in, and they conquer a lot of towns in Israel, such as Kadesh and Hatzor and Gilead, and they take a lot of prisoners back to Assyria. This begins the scattering of Israel. So we're at 732 BC. All right, so remember Amos was about 760 BC, 732 BC. We're, we're getting... Um, Isaiah by now, Isaiah probably starts maybe as early as 750, but somewhere in there, but, uh, but he's in full swing at this time period. Uh, and this is the beginning of the scattering of Israel when, uh, because Pekah has withheld tribute, the Assyrians take a lot of Israelites uh, and bring them to Assyria and elsewhere, and, and the scattering begins. So many of our ancestors would have uh, been scattered at this time period. Um, during Pekah's reign, uh, Azariah or Uzziah, king of Judah, dies, and his son jo Jotham starts to reign, and he reigns righteously, um, and he fortifies uh, Jerusalem and, and builds fortifications throughout uh, Judah, and he defeats Ammonites and receives tribute from them and so on. But then he dies, and his son Ahaz takes the throne. Um, this is Ahaz that, uh, that Isaiah works with, all right? And Isaiah takes the throne and turns to a lot of wickedness and idolatry. Um, Israel and Syria go to war against Judah. This is before 730 BC, all right? So we're kind of bouncing back and forth because that's what they do in the scriptures. So this is, is before that. Israel and Syria go to war against Judah, and they try to force them to be an ally with, with them against Assyria. Uh, we'll cover that more in depth when we're doing Isaiah, say, 7 through 9, because that's the, the Emmanuel prophecy is about this, what we call the Syro-Ephraimite War. So the Emmanuel prophecy is associated with this. Uh, but in any case, um, they defeat Judah and they carry away a lot of captives to Damascus. And Pekah defeats Judah and slays a lot of Judahites or Jews um, and take them as slaves to Samaria. And then a prophet Oded meets them and he tells them, hey, God doesn't want you to take people from Judah as your captives. And many in Samaria demand that the captives are freed. And so they are. And these Samaritans clothe them and care for them and return them to Jericho uh, and so on, which is a nice story. Anyway. Um, besides these defeats under the, the reign of wicked King Ahaz, Judah is smitten by the Edomites and the Philistines. So you can see they're, they're whereas uh, under these more righteous kings, they're having great gains. Now they're having losses um, and they lose places like uh, the Ayalon Valley and Shoko and Timna, pla places in Judah proper. They're losing control of those and people like the Philistines are gaining control. Um, Ahaz appeals to the Assyrians for help. Um, this is for help against all these little things, but especially against Syria and Israel. Uh, and again, we'll talk about that at length in Isaiah. But the Assyrians under King tiglath pileser the third or pole, come and they conquer Damascus and they end that conflict. And uh, this is the same time that they then keep going down into Israel and take many people from Israel captive. Uh, so this is that 732 BC beginning of the scattering that we're talking about. And it's in response partially to Pekah rebelling against Assyria as he's allied himself with Syria and is trying to force Judah to join them in this rebellion. And partially due to Judah saying, come help me, Assyria. And Assyria does come help. And they take away uh, all these uh, people from Syria and Israel. Uh, but uh, Ahaz has kind of let the tiger in the room, as it were, because uh, now that Assyria is there, they're going to afflict Judah. And, um, and Judah will become a vassal of Assyria. So Ahaz will go and meet the Assyrians in Damascus. And he's so taken in by 
their idolatry that he brings a lot of these wicked practices back to Judah to get them to worship idols like the uh, Assyrians do. Uh, again, we turn so quickly to what uh, the world is doing. It's just so sad. Anyway, during all of this, a man named Hosea assassinates Pekah, king of Israel, probably because of all these intrigues going on, you know, battles and losses and so on. Um, he assassinates Pekah and sets himself up as king. So Hosea withholds tribute from Assyria, and he looks to Egypt for help. And, uh, and then uh, the Assyrians uh, send their king, uh, Shalmaneser, at this point, Tiglath-Pileser III has died. Uh, and they come and besiege Samaria, and eventually they take the city. But just as they do, Shalmaneser dies. And his son, Sargon II, has to hurry back to Assyria to make sure he can claim the throne. And then after some time, he returns and he has to resiege and retake Samaria. And when he does, he deports a lot of Israelites from throughout the kingdom, especially the elite. But he empties out a whole big chunk of the kingdom. And he brings other people in from other lands to intermarry and settle the area. This is one of the ways that the Assyrians deal with uh, people who keep rebelling is they figure, well, there's a nationalistic tendency Maybe we can get rid of that by moving a lot of people away from the land. So there's less nationalism, having other people come in that, that were rebelling in their land. So they move them in and you get this intermarrying. So there's less nationalism, less excitement about this is our land and we need to control it and so on. And that's what happens. Um, and uh, that doesn't work so well, though. So there, there are a lot of bad things that are happening to this intermarried group. So a priest comes and teaches them how to worship the God of the land. And uh, they, they adopt kind of a mixed religion. Um, but much of Israel spread throughout the Assyrian Empire. So all of this is happening about 721 BC. All right. This is when we get even more of the scattering of Israel and the fall of the kingdom of Israel. All right. So meanwhile, after Hosea's third year is, uh, year is the king of Israel, Ahaz, king of Judah, dies and his son Hezekiah becomes king instead. Now, Hezekiah initially is going to turn to Egypt for help in rebelling against the Assyrians, but then he will listen to Isaiah and uh, turn to God for help instead, and he'll repair and cleanse the temple and uh, do all sorts of religious reforms. And we'll talk about this more in depth when we do Isaiah, uh, but he gets people to uh, follow God, and um, the uh, Assyrians will invade, um, and Hezekiah is, is uh, he's withholding tribute and so on. So Hezekiah will resist Assyria. Mo, or, or, yeah, and most of Judah is destroyed, but under righteous King Hezekiah and everyone repenting and trying to keep the covenant, Jerusalem is spared and Assyria goes home. Uh, and that's a fantastic thing. Uh, and we'll do that story at length again when we cover Isaiah, because it's both in Second Kings and Isaiah. You get kind of the same chapters in there covering the same time period. Um, anyway. Eventually, Hezekiah dies, and his son Manasseh takes the throne, and um, he remains an Assyrian vassal, uh, which means Hezekiah must have been at least to some degree, but we can't really see uh, notice of that in, in Hezekiah. But anyway, uh, and he pays tribute to Assyria and uh, has to send people to participate in Assyrian wars. Uh, that's really the issue with this tribute um, that, and why people keep rebelling, because not only are you sending a lot of money, but you have to keep sending your kids to serve in the army and to serve in the palaces and be whatever kind of servants and slaves they want them to be, the, the daughters there. And, uh, and uh, it doesn't take very many years of having to send a tribute, right? You can think in terms of who will be tribute in Hunger Games. It's a similar kind of idea that it, uh, after a while of having to send tribute after tribute, and then you keep losing your children to these uh, places that people are willing to rebel, even though they know it's gonna be a lot of death and misery, they just can't take it anymore. Um, so, uh, Manasseh is, is doing this for Assyria and, and he's really a very, very wicked king tradition holds that he kills Isaiah. Um, and he's certainly wicked, but, um, according to, to the second Chronicles account, he, he turns eventually, uh, he, he turns to every form of idolatry that Israel's ever known. And it's one of the most wicked Kings of Judah, but then he's punished and he repents and turns to the Lord. Uh, and he's released from some captivity and uh, comes back to Jerusalem and tries to rebuild the walls in the temple. Um, when he dies, his son Amos becomes king. And we're now, uh, the northern kingdom is conquered and gone. So we don't bounce back and forth anymore between these two kingdoms because the northern kingdom is gone. Um, so he dies and his son Amos becomes king. And he really full turns to idolatry and his servants kill him. And uh, then his servants are punished and his son Josiah is made king. 
Um, and Josiah is going to be a very righteous king. But in the meantime, Assyria is growing weaker and Egypt's growing stronger. And there's some conflict between them and they gain control of uh, some land there. Egypt does and, and they rule some land and there's going to be some interaction between um uh, Judah and Egypt and, and so on. And, and that's going to end up being important, uh, later. Um, but anyway, we're going to get, uh, Egypt will end up controlling the area on behalf of Assyria eventually. And then, um, it's kind of nominally in, in, on behalf of Assyria, but really for themselves. Um, and, uh, all sorts of stuff is, is going on there politically that we're not going to worry about. I, I'd love to get into it. I find it so fascinating, but we won't do it. Um, but, uh, what happens is Assyria is, is becoming weaker and their, uh, big neighbor Babylon that they have taken over, which has been an empire on its own before starts to rebel against them. And eventually, uh, Babylon conquers Assyria and Assyria falls. Um, in the midst of all this, Josiah, who is a very righteous king and is trying to repair the temple, and uh, they find uh, in their writings uh, about the temple and covenant that they seem to have lost, and uh, lots of evidence suggests this is the book of Deuteronomy. And so Josiah has the book of Deuteronomy read to all the people, and they engage in nationally making the covenant again, and he gets them to repent, and this goes really, really well. Um, but eventually, uh, Josiah will be killed by uh, an Egyptian king at Megiddo. Uh, I have all sorts of ideas as to what's going on there politically and why, but that would take a long time, and, and most people don't care. So we won't get into that now. Uh, but if you, if I, I'll write this book next for next time we do Old Testament, and I'll have some stuff in there. Anyway, so when Josiah dies, his son Jehoahaz becomes king, and he's wicked. And uh, the Necho, the pharaoh of Egypt, takes Jehoahaz uh, captive. And uh, this seems to be right after he's killed Josiah. Anyway, and then he puts his brother Eliakim on the throne. And Necho changes Eliakim's throne name to Jehoiakim. And uh, at this point, we know none of the kings are going to fully follow Judah. Um, and Jehoiakim is going to start to pay large sums of tribute to Necho and taxes to people in order to do this and, and so on. And it's about this time that we're going to start to get, um, oh, I should have mentioned that uh, Micah overlapped with Isaiah. All right. So that's a contemporary prophet. And, and we're coming up now, we're getting close to the days of Jeremiah. Okay. So um, we, we, as we've said, the Assyrians have fallen and in 605 or in 604 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, um, uh, who has become uh, as the king of Babylon has taken over all of the Assyrian empire. He attacks Judah. Uh, as he's trying to regain uh, everything that was Assyria's empire. Judah had at one point been part of that. So he attacks Judah and Judah capitulates and becomes a vassal of Babylon. And they, they uh, pay tribute uh, to them and they send people as part of their tribute. And Daniel and, and his friends are part of the group that are taken from Judah to Babylon. So this is where we start to get Daniel as a boy being taken into Babylon. Um, and... Uh, after uh, three years of uh, Nebuchadnezzar controlling all of this, Jehoiakim uh, withholds his tribute. And so Nebuchadnezzar sends his troops and an army uh, of his own troops and vassals um, against uh, Judah. And uh, just as this is happening, Jehoiakim dies and his son Jehoiakim. So the first one is Jehoiakim with an M and his son Jehoiakim with an N. Uh, Jehoiakim takes the throne just as this is happening. So Nebuchadnezzar's troops arrive and Jehoiakim, the brand new king greets him and brings a, a tribute and attempts to pacify him. And Nebuchadnezzar takes Jehoiakim and all of his household and most of the elite of Judah, and he carries them captive into Babylon. So we're getting more people being taken captive into Babylon. Um, and uh, we're, this is Jeremiah's prophesying during this time period. All right. And uh, we also find uh, during this first deportation that we're going to, because the, the Babylonians take the elite into different places, that's not only where we're going to get Daniel there, but Ezekiel, who was a priest, is part of a group that's taken into Babylon. And Ezekiel starts to prophesy to this uh, Jewish group in Babylon by the river Chabar, while Daniel is in the uh, king's court and Jeremiah is in Jerusalem. So they're all three contemporary and prophesying at the same time. Jeremiah, seemingly this uh, kind of senior, both in terms of age and probably in terms of leadership role, but we don't really know about that, but Daniel's probably the youngest and, and Ezekiel's in between there. All right. So 
Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, as I said, he's taken Jehoiakim and he's going to take him back to Babylon, but he takes his uncle and he puts him on the throne and gives him uh, the throne name of Zedekiah. And Zedekiah is a loyal vassal for a few years, um, but eventually he will withhold tribute from Nebuchadnezzar as well. Um, and uh, there are a lot of different kind of factions and things going on at this time period that we'll cover more when we get to Jeremiah. Um, but, but Zedekiah will, will stop paying tribute again, largely because I would guess because of the pressure uh, put on him by people who are tired of all their children being taken away. Um, and because of this uh, rebellion, Nebuchadnezzar again besieges Jerusalem. And after a long siege and, and a great famine comes about because of that, um, the Babylonians get through. And, and we should note that uh, it, both in the sieges that Assyria brings about and that Babylon brings about, more people tend to die from the famine uh, as a result of that siege uh, than from the, the wars in Jerusalem. But it, it, we don't really can't tell that for sure. But that's what seems to be going on anyway. Um, as he's getting through the walls, a lot of people are going to flee, including King Zedekiah. So he attempts to flee the country, fleeing towards Jericho, and he's caught there and taken to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar has his sons killed before him, and then he puts his eyes out. So that the last thing he'll see is the death of all of his sons and know that there's no dynasty continuing after him. Now, we know that doesn't, isn't completely true because he has a son named Mulek who escapes and uh, travels to uh, the Americas and his descendants are known as the Mulekites and they meet the Nephites and it's all sorts of exciting history there. Anyway, um, all but the most poor are taken captive to Babylon and the temples pillaged and destroyed and religious leaders and political leaders of Judah are slain um, and so on. So that's when we get, um, uh, again, Jeremiah, uh, the lamentations will be over the destruction of Jerusalem and so on. So we get all sorts of uh, interesting story going on there. Um, there are a couple of things uh, that are worth thinking about, uh, a couple of lessons I just want to draw from this. And I'm going to, uh, for uh, those on YouTube, I'm going to share my, my screen. Um, uh, let's see here uh, if I can find the right one. Um, there we go. Uh, and uh, just to show some charts and for um, the listening audience, I think I can uh, describe these these charts pretty well. The first one, I have a chart where we, uh, the so all the kings in Israel and Judah are introduced with a formula. It's a different formula for the kings of Judah than it is for the kings of Israel, but they're pretty close. Uh, they'll state the, the king's name uh, and, and what year they start to reign. And it's usually the, you know, the, uh, if it's the king of Judah, it's in the 13th year of King so-and-so in Israel that this king in Judah start to reign, and they'll tell you the name of his mother and so on. And then they always include whether they did right in the sight of the Lord or whether they did evil in the sight of the Lord. So uh, I've got this chart, and I have kings of Judah and those who did right in the sight of the Lord. And we've got uh, Asa, Jehoash, Amaziah, Azariah, slash Uzziah, Jotham, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Those are the kings that are listed as doing right in the sight of the Lord. All right, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Is that right? One, two, three, four, seven. All right. Those who did evil in the sight of the Lord, we've got Rehoboam, Abijam, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Athaliah, Ahaz, Manasseh, Ammon, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. All right, so that's a lot more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Now, a lot of those ruled for shorter time, but anyway. Um, but this is why, and it's especially a bunch of those are towards the end of uh, Judah's reign, and this is part of why they're going to end up being destroyed, all right? Now, let's look at the kings of Israel. We're going to look at the kings that did evil in the sight of the Lord. We've got Jeroboam, Nadab, Basha, Elah, Zimri, Omri, Ahab, Ahaziah, Jehoram, Jehu, Jehoahaz, Jehoash, Jeroboam, Zechariah, Shalom, Menachem, Pekiah, Pekah, and Hosea, all right? I'm not even going to count them. Those are the kings that did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to this formula. Now we're going to read the names of the kings that, uh, of Israel that it says did right in the sight of the Lord. Yeah, that's silence because it's a blank column. Now, some of that, as I said, may be political. Jehu started out trying to do right in the sight of the Lord. He was pretty violent, did a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, Jeroboam, in a number of ways, did that which is right in the sight of the Lord. But none of them got rid of the idolatry that Jeroboam introduced. And as a result, none of them are going to be described as doing that, which is right on the side of the Lord. And 
Uh, also, I mean, there's some political bias because this record's written by Judah, as I said. But this is why there's so much idolatry uh, in Israel and why they're, they're destroyed in 720 BC as opposed to 586 BC. I didn't give you that date. The, the destruction of Jerusalem under the Babylonians is 586 BC. So you're looking at, at uh, almost 140 years later. Uh, that the Judah lasts 140 years later because they have some righteous kings. Now, it's hard to know how much of this uh, business of having righteous kings um, is because the people are righteous, so you get righteous kings, or the kings are righteous, so you get the people to be righteous. But the way the Bible tells the story, it seems to be largely that the, the people followed their leaders. And if their leaders were wicked, they were wicked. And if their leaders were righteous, they were righteous. We just, we see that consistently again and again and again. And this is one of the most important lessons I think we can learn from this story and this storyline. What kind of leaders are you choosing in your life? And to some degree, I mean political leaders, but I hope we're trying to find righteous people and get them to run for office and vote for them. But it's not just that, that there are political leaders, but even more in our day, we have thought leaders. Some of those thought leaders are coming from Hollywood. Some of them are coming from Radio City. Some of them are coming from the ivory towers of academia. And, and uh, some of them are coming from uh, newspapers and blogs and things like that. Influencers and thought leaders, right? Who are you choosing to follow? You're choosing to follow someone. If you are spending most of your time uh, watching shows, uh, you should be very aware of who is creating those and what kind of messages are they sending in those shows because it will influence you. If they are trying to influence you for wickedness and there's a lot of social engineering that's happening from uh, Hollywood as they try and create the society that those people think we should have and they have been incredibly successful so that uh, much of our social values and societal issues are created and, and formed and how we think about them come from Hollywood. If that's where you're spending your time, it will affect you. If you, your time determines who your leaders are, who are you listening to? If you are listening to those leaders a lot, it's going to affect you. Now, I'm not saying we can't ever watch any shows or read any books. We just have to be careful, right? I find that there are a lot of shows I would like to watch but I can't because there's too much junk in them. Same thing with music. Uh, there, who, who are we letting affect us? Listen to those lyrics, right? So I'll just tell you, there, there are a couple of Queen songs that I love the beat. Uh, I love the guitar riffs and so on, but the lyrics are terrible and I just can't let myself listen to them. Uh, the, and, and so we have to think about that. How about who are we reading and who are we listening to on the radio and so on? Uh, choose your thought leaders carefully, very carefully, because the lesson of our ancestors is if we have wicked leaders, and then these days there's so many leaders, we get to choose who is our leader, uh, not just again politically, but in terms of who influences us. If we have wicked leaders, we will fall. That's the lesson we can learn from this. There's, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. Now, to help us refine that a little bit more, I'm going to read to you another chart because in these formulas where it, it uh, describes the kings and whether they were righteous in the sight of the Lord or, or wicked, uh, we often get kind of uh, whether they're, they're either very bad or bad or good or very good, all right? Every king, uh, you can tell whether they thought they were really, really bad or just bad and good or really, really good. And so I uh, just compiled a list of uh, what was common among those who were very bad, what was common among those that were bad, and uh, so on and good and very good. And it was, it's remarkably consistent. So here are the characteristics of kings that are very bad. They cause their children to pass through the fire. So that's, that's child sacrifice. They build high places and groves. So they are actively uh, building up idolatry. They worshiped Baal. They worship the hosts of heaven. So very active in, uh, again, idolatry. They consult wizards and familiar spirits and enchanters, and they shed innocent blood. Uh, all right, all of that is, uh, you can see why that's bad. They are actively building up idolatry. Um, those who are bad, they allowed idols. They allowed groves. They allowed sodomites, and they forsook the Lord. All right, so mostly they're being bad is the result of not being good, right? Not, not doing the positive things. They're, they're not actively engaged in the bad things, but they're not getting rid of the bad things. 
All right, so let's look at good. If, if you were good, you're someone who followed the Lord and you kept the commandments and you didn't sponsor false worship. You may not have gotten rid of the high places and the groves and so on, but you didn't sponsor it. All right. Now let's look at the list of those who are very good. They followed the Lord and they kept the commandments. They removed idols. They removed sodomites. They tore down high places. They removed items of false worship from the temple and elsewhere. They cut down groves. They broke images. They got rid of false priests. They removed wizards and necromancers, etc. All right. So if I'm hoping that for us, we, we've got two things to learn from here. What kind of people are we following and what kind of people are we being? And I hope that we are following people that fit in the very good column. And But too often, the thought leaders that we associate with are in the very bad column. They are building up the wrong kind of thing instead of removing the wrong kind of thing uh, and, and building up the right kind of thing. Uh, and so we need to look for these leaders that are very good. But if we're going to talk about ourselves and think in terms of are you, I'm hoping that you're either good or very good, right? The question is, are you um, kind of passively being good? You're not doing the bad stuff and you're following God and keeping the commandments. Are you actively being good? You're, you're following God, keeping the commandments, and you're getting rid of the bad stuff in your life and helping the people around you get rid of the bad stuff. Uh, that's what makes the difference between good or very good. And I, I hope we'll think about that. It's, it's really important to understand the importance of leaders in our lives and all kinds of leaders, but I plead with you to look at the thought leaders in your life, whether that be Facebook uh, and who you're listening to on Facebook, whether that be blogs or, or vlogs or YouTubers or uh, people who write columns or whatever it is, you have thought leaders. Who are the thought leaders in your life? And are they very bad or bad or good or very good? And where are you? Are you good or are you very good? And be intentional about this. Think about it. Identify it. These are the lessons we can learn from our Israelite ancestors. Be careful about it. Think about it. Identify what's going on. And then let's go do some good. In fact, let's go do some very good. And that's my 